So just about our funding, head technician. It, my technician is actually like the third longest employee at the university because he doesn't ever want to retire and he got hired out of high school. It's not very often you have a technician with 45 years of experience, right? He's been there from high school. He's so old that, they, that he actually has dependable funding. <laughs> wow, that's old. Uh, everything else is soft funding. Uh, last year, royalties paid 65, well, there's a royalty 65% go to the program, 35 equipment. We get governments from the government. The year of no funding, when they canceled the native fruit program, we sold their plants to raise money. <laughs> and now our annual plant sale day, which is June, first Friday of every June, we have thousands of people come, and we usually make fifteen to twenty thousand dollars that day. One day, and we only do one day, and we won't take pre-orders, we won't ship, so. Uh, but uh, it was. It's something now we can't, we're addicted to the money. So we don't need the money, but it's nice, and everyone wants it. The dean gave me hell one year for having my plant sale during the time she had to be at convocation. Because she wanted to go to our plant sale. She's the only one who'll get plants early. So workshop fees, we always charge for the workshop. That cookbook, the cherry cookbook, we get the proceeds from. And uh, we sell some manuals, and uh, volunteers help us a lot. Year of no funding, uh, well, you're probably one of them. Came, there were like a dozen, oh, a dozen people that came to our greenhouse, planted seeds in the greenhouse. Then they bought half the plants, paying the greenhouse fee, and we got all these plants for free. We planted. We never planted so many plants up to that point. Can learn how to tissue culture. Yeah, and they, we taught some of them tissue culture. Uh, yeah. That's right. So we have two main technicians right now. Rick, uh, that's when he's a little bit younger. And there's Ellen. She does all our quality control stuff on HASCAP and lab stuff. And then we have three graduate students. Eric, who's from BC. James, uh, he's from BC. He's from Nova Scotia. And Baratoga's from Mongolia. So I think we've got like the world covered. And, the sun never sets on where our graduate students come from. Right? Uh, I want to point out that since I got my job in 1999, half the fruit programs of Canada have been canceled. And the ones that are remaining, many of them are downsized. Or like in BC here, when the, the cherry breeder retired, they gave the job to the person who's doing apples and pears. That's kind of like canceling it. She still has resources, but so I think the X's are a little bit off on some of this, but and we're also the only one in zone two. Most of these, this actually slid down a little bit. The other ones are more like zone five. Our program started in 1921. And originally we had 200 acres for horticulture on campus. Now we have 70 acres, about 50 used for us. So we might be the coldest place in the world where some of these fruits are being bred. Uh, the Siberia Research Station and us both get around minus 40. Someone from Siberia was convinced the Saskatchewan winters were longer. <laughs> but you know, it could be her arthritis was picking up and it really wasn't as bad. But uh, So we have to maintain all these plants. We can't, we can't take plants from other areas and use them. We have to use these semi-wild things. So we have a big gene bank collection of things that might be good for somebody someday. And there's the, all the predecessors that came in. Uh, that's what I looked like when I started. <laughs> right, so I like to say my berries have grown in proportion to my, my belly. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, Hascap is something just Rick and I did. He had planted them four varieties in 2000, or 1997. Uh, when I saw them flowering and fruiting in 2000, I started crosses the next year. Now we supposedly have the most world's diverse Hascap collection. Uh, partly because both Russia and Japan think highly of Canada. They happily sent me material. 
my American friend couldn't get anyone from Russia to send her anything. I didn't say that I had dual citizenship, I didn't tell them. Uh, and Japan sent us stuff, and those two never really shared with each other. They might now that there's younger people. But say they sent stuff to me and I got other stuff. So we actually, well this number is a little low now, but we generally use traditional breeding and we usually plant five to 7,000 plants per year, but we raise two to three times that and throw away the wimpy ones in the greenhouse. So we only plant the vigorous ones now. And there's that website article. This is all the fruits we're working on and I tried to make the picture in proportion to what we spend our effort on. So Hascap has the most effort going on, but we have a back, we're building up a huge collection of hazelnut uh, hybrids between wild Canadian and European. The apples, my technician Rick loves that in the fall when I'm teaching. We're still doing lots of other crops on the side, like we'll, we'll do crosses of uh, plums one year, made 2,000 or 3,000 plum seedlings, and then we let them grow for seven years. So then we don't do anything for them. This is our uh, aerial shot, and you'll see that Hascat dominates our, our acreage. And this is all what we planted, I think, most recently, the last two or three years. Okay. Uh, repeat of that, repeat of that. Gee. So how many years do you feel they are still vigorous without needing to replace them? Um, in Japan, I saw the old test plots that were 25 years old, the original best wild ones, and they were still highly productive. I think it depends on whether you're regularly pruning them to renew them. If you let them turn into a rat's nest of stuff, they're not going to look so good. But it's, they should last longer than anyone in this room, if you took care of them. So, um, just do some more recent ones. Um, we got lots of seed families from Russia. Finally, in 2010, we got a mechanical harvester. We, I think I didn't mention that when we got the mechanical harvester, I discovered we had been much rougher with our hands, pretending to be machines, than the machine was. Uh, the machine, first run through the field, made no need to have that sorting line in the back. And hardly anything was bleeding. Right? From, and this is seedling lots, just average berries going through it. So we, that tundra is like super durable, uh, and we've used tundra a lot in breeding. What happened in, in 2010 was our royalties money got high enough that I could hire a graduate student without having a grant. And so my first graduate student was Eric from BC. His instructor, who had been at Saskatchewan, said, this is one of the smartest students I've ever had. So I said, oh, you want to come with me? Come on, I'll work on Haskell, but you have to promise to apply for scholarships so I don't have to pay you anymore. Then I'll get another graduate student. Well, this carried on for three graduate students. So that original, it was almost like a pyramid plan. <laughs> You grab the great student, they develop their own project that everyone likes, that they love, not something that a grant told them to do, and then they get a scholarship and then you go, you, have, you still have your royalties coming, you get another one. So we've gotten triple feed on, on the uh, scholarships. So like a year later, he got a, this first graduate student got a scholarship. Then the other one got one like a year or two later. So we have uh, uh, the third Haskap just started. Uh, I think I'm going to go into more detail as we go. So this is what our, our um, greenhouse looks like, probably end of May or early June. When I first started reading Haskap, uh, we would grow them in plugs, and we sprout them, I think, January or so, and they'd get about this big by time June for planting. But because we've been throwing away the unvigorous ones, and now all the ones in the field are vigorous and using those in crosses, we have uh, plants in the greenhouse today that are this tall. And they still have another two months to grow 
Like the vigor changing from those first families is going to is much bigger than before. We we have this automatic watering floor that we love because it we don't have to be there and it waters it like that. So we take over half of that giant greenhouse. This is just to show you when you grow them from seed. This is the same you know controlled cross. Somebody went out in the field and pick pollen from one plant specifically to go on another. You plant the seedlings, and look at these little spindly ones here, but then you've got some really super strong hybrids, right? So we would say, you know, there might have been, I think this tray holds 67 plants or something like that. Uh, we might only keep 15 of them. So I think in the more recent generations, the flavor is not is getting a little bit better. Not, it's not tremendously different, but what's really different is the plant vigor and growth rates. So there they are. We put them in the bigger pots. So we've actually go in, uh, throughout the growing season, I spend uh, probably at least three days a week combing the, the plants, and I have some technicians do it, but I don't quite trust what they do. So. I double check, but we go around with tape, that uh, flagging tape, and any plants that look interesting, we put a flag on it. And then as we go through the growing season, uh, if we didn't like it the second time, it doesn't get a second flag. And then when it comes to harvest, we look at the ones with the most flags, and if we still like it, and we taste the berries, uh, we pick them and photograph them like this. So I have like, 150 pictures from 2013, and I have only 85 pictures last year, and just as a record of what they uh, look like, right? So there's Indigo Gem, the most one of the most popular ones, and you can see that some of these we always have a standard in each field of either Indigo Gem or Tundra to compare to. So we we know what the fruits are bigger. And we describe them. And these, anything that gets picked gets lab analysis later on for sugar, acidity, flavor after being frozen. It already has a note on flip before. The weight, the length, and stuff like that. Uh, if we really like it one year, the next year we intercross it with everything in its bloom category because we want to find the compatible plant that overlaps its bloom perfectly. So we would cross all of these, and these are just some notes, right? So each one, there's Aurora uh, doing good with a bullet one, an arrow-shaped one, and one that's boxy and a flat rectangle, <laughs> right? So uh, we're, we're looking for different things uh, and, and the bloom period. So there's Aurora, uh, Tundra, Indigo, Gem, which are the top ones. Aurora tends to be a little bit bigger, maybe 50%, but certainly sweeter, but very similar in size. It looks a little more lumpy than the others. You should have seen this one that we have. It was really zigzagging. I got to dig up the picture of that time. It looked so ugly. I was going to name it Ugly Duckling, but uh, anyway. So this is uh, Blizzard. Uh, two years ago, right, it was one of the largest ones. <clears throat> well, there's the ceiling being planted. Uh, we also had to do a lot of research on tissue culture so the plants could be propagated quickly. When I first started my job, tissue culture companies wanted me to pay them money to bother trying to propagate my plants. I think we were usually quoted five to six thousand dollars and we'll take your plants. Well, I, I actually did, have been doing tissue culture since I was in my 20s, in my various jobs. So we develop protocols which we don't share with everybody. We don't publish papers on, on, on propagation, but we do tell our propagators what we do. And then they do it better than we do and keep their secrets. So we're usually, uh, quite ready to give the plants out. There they are in tissue culture. That allows us to grow plants all winter long, and every month and a half you might get five times more plants. So you can turn one original plant 
theoretically, if you didn't run out of labor or make a mistake, you might have 200,000 the following year, and you could have millions the following year. Uh, so here's about this project, the recent project that's just ending now. This just shows you the types of crosses we did each year. Main crosses are ones where we find plants that are pretty good, and we think if we hybridize the two, we'll get the perfect new variety, right? You know, like one is maybe it drops its fruit a little bit, but it's really big. And the other one holds its fruit, but it's a little small. So we've, this is how many controlled crosses we did. In 2012, we did 220 controlled crosses. And that's not one flowers. That's a branch of flowers or sometimes a whole bush. Uh, and then we did certain crosses with super fast growing things, right? So uh, we did these vigor crosses that year. The next year we did mostly main crosses, but new stuff from Japan and wild Canadian stuff and more new stuff from Japan. So we've done in the last three years 600 types of combinations between parents. Uh, so. Uh, ASCAP day events, okay, 150 common, it was 2006. This is on average since 2006. So it's a little higher more recently. But we usually we plant one to two acres of very high density ASCAP, and we throw away one or two acres per year. Uh, this just shows you the weight of uh, the advanced selections that we like. Right? Remember, one is what the biggest Russian was, right? and uh, there were, uh, Maxine has some two grand, something like that. But this just shows you the range of what's possible, what we liked. So in 2012, we only made a few selections, but 2.8 to 0.8, like these, are, these sizes over here are much larger than I see anywhere uh, released. The only one who will be close to this is Maxine when she comes out. Because actually some of our largest berries have her, some plants of her as one of the parents. This is showing bloom time for us, right? And this would be a peak bloom for each variety. So in 2012, peak bloom between was kind of short, only a two week period. Uh, May 21st to June 3rd. May 23rd to June 5th. So they actually bloom, can bloom a week or two earlier than that to start. Sugar content is variable. Uh, probably it's best to look at the middle year because there's more plants. 10% sugar. There was one that was 24% bricks and it tasted disgustingly weird. Like there was, it must have had some horrible mutation. Uh, that happened in that, but we nobody liked that one. So don't get all excited about that brick level. Uh, and, but it certainly is able to get, you know, around 18 to 20 would be a nice, nice range. But there you see the acidity levels, right? Uh, uh, Aurora is around this level. All our, all of our first varieties are around this level. So it looks like we've shifted a little bit lower soon. Now to talk about what the graduate students are. Okay, so they've won NSERT, Knowles, uh, Mongolian government, and some other grants. This is just listing them. They all now have scholars. So here's Eric, your uh, hometown guy. His uh, basic thesis is studying the genetics of Haskell. He's and how they adapt to. BC, I think he's Kelowna, Abbotsford area. He has uh, one main plot, and then he's got three more in that range where he's testing the parents, right? So his thing has been to look at the three major different types of Haskap, the Japanese, Russian, and Kirill, and the hybrids between them, and to see how they differ from the parents uh, will give us like a blueprint of not only breeding, but what's adaptable, uh, certainly here. So there's one of his uh, farmer test sites. He's put that kind of uh, bird netting on there. And he's a workaholic. I came to visit him a couple of years ago, and the three test sites 
and his big site, which has like 300 plants, he was trying to get yield on that day and staying up all night measuring everything he gathered all day long. I said, you know, you could put those in the refrigerator and weigh them tomorrow. <laughs> you know, but anyway, he, he was doing He's made these complex graphs, which when he writes his thesis up, it'll be maybe interesting, but he also planted blueberries, raspberries, and strawberries in his field plan so that you could adjust, people in the future could say, oh, this plant bloomed before strawberries. I don't have the same weather as southern BC, but I would expect mine would bloom before strawberries, or, or you know, that you could tie it into these crops. So uh, he has uh, the three kinds of plants and hybrids, and, and he's showing where they get harvested. So uh, that'll be very interesting. He even did not just doing peak yield, he did early yield, peak yield, end of yield, and he's been a workaholic. The committee told him he can't put half of what he did in, in his thesis. Otherwise, he'll have a thousand page thesis. Um, he also did sugar and acidity, and I think I've got a graph. Um, and he compared them to strawberries. I think I've, we use his poster as an example of too much to write on a poster. <laughs> he just gets too enthused. I've heard professors going, okay, you've just seen the, the not enough poster down the hall. Now here's an example of someone writing too much. <laughs> <laughs>